Okay, so uh, just want to welcome you all and welcome everybody that's on Facebook. If you're watching, no matter where you are, you know you're loved and we're happy that you're joining us. Uh, do me a favor. What am I about to say? Yeah, open your Bible. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to feast. Uh, we're going to feast, right? Anyone hungry? So we're going to feast on Matthew 6, 19 through 34, and uh, I'm going to title this message this evening, it's kind of appropriate for what we talked about in a minute ago, appropriate for our week here in America, but the title of tonight's message is, Is God in Control? Is God in Control? So when I ask, when I say that, you guys got to help me out with my sermon tonight, okay? So when I say... God is in control. What do you like? What do you feel like? Say something. He is. Good. 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 He is. He is. He is. Okay. Um. I agree with that, but maybe differently than what you believe in. Uh, I believe that He's in control, but not to the extent that He controls and determines each little detail that happens across the entire universe. Even though I. See, verses in Scripture say that his plans can't be thwarted. These things are the things that confuse me. I don't know about you, but I get a little confused about some of the things that are of God. But again, his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And Paul said, who can understand the thoughts of God? This is the guy who's telling us the thoughts of God. He's like, I don't even understand them. So, so it's a little bit confusing sometimes, but I don't believe that he controls that's just me. I don't believe that he controls or determines each little detail that happens throughout the entire universe. And if we could understand the, the vast uh, stars and planets and all that the universe holds, I think that would blow your brain. But I don't know what he's doing over this planet that's, you know, 100 million miles away from here. But I personally don't think that he controls at least the way we would define control. Um, if he alone controlled every single detail, every single move in all of the universe, why would his word be filled with directives that we're to choose to obey or not? That's where I kind of get into those, man, I don't, I mean, like, like when I think of the word control, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about the word control, I think of it as almost like a puppet master, like, I'm telling you what to think. I'm telling you what to say. I'm telling you what to do. I'm dictating where your step, what you spend, what you do, what you think, what you say. Like, that's what I think of when I think of the word control. But I know, I'm not quite sure that anyone fully comprehends this whole sovereignty of God. And so there's this verse after verse, if you will, of directives in Scripture that we're supposed to choose to obey or disobey. But ulti however, ultimate control does belong to God because any and all freedom that we have is given and allowed by this Creator. Would you agree? I agree with that. So how do we know that this is the case, that He's in control, but yet he's not in control of every little thing. Well, there's guys that are a lot smarter than me. I was, I was, um, I was watching a, a, a conversation. You guys know who Ravi Zacharias is? Guy's like brilliant, right? Guy, he's one of the most brilliant men on the earth. He's a Christian apologist. If you're an atheist and you stand up and you challenge him, he will decapitate you verbally, and you won't even feel your head being severed. Guy's insane brilliant. So someone asked him the other day about how could, it, how could God be good with all this bad stuff that goes on? And of course, in Ravi's style, he just gets up calm as can be because he knows the answer. And he's like, well, here, here's the thing. Love is the highest of human ethics. Like, There's nothing that's above love. You know, the great commandment. What, 
Someone goes up to Jesus and says, what's the greatest commandment? What does he say? Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. John 13 and John 15, Jesus says, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Like, that is the highest of all ethic. Nothing should be above love. But if you don't have the option to choose it, then it's not love. That's a robot, right? And that's not really love. No choice, no love, right? Got to have choices. Does that mean God's not in control? That's not true. He is, but we have the choice whether we're going to love him or not. See, this, this, this idea of of him commanding his creation to love him with all of, all of your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, and to love one another just as I have loved you. And that's a crazy love, right? Cross love. And he says, I, you, I'm commanding you to do this. That's not automatically programmed into you so that you just do it automatically like a robot. You have to choose to do that, don't you? All of us have to choose to do that. Robotic submission is not true love. Some things that God created are, when I say robotic, I mean like, you know, you plug in, this is what I want you to do, computer, this robot, and this is what it does. It doesn't think of its own. Some things that God made are sort of robotic in a sense. Like, I don't know, I'm not a scientist or anything, but, you know, suppose, I know if you flat earthers, you'll be offended, but for the rest of us, the earth is supposedly spinning on its axis right now. It's some crazy number. Isn't it like 1,000 miles an hour or something? What is it? More than that? 100,000 miles? I don't even But it's spinning, right? It's supposed to be spinning? That's robotic, right? Like it's not, I don't know, but I don't think Mother Earth is really a mom. I don't think she's really thinking, you know what? I just feel like spinning at 100,000 miles an hour today. I don't think that that's what's happening. I think God just programmed it that way. This is what I want, and boom, it's just spinning. Not by choice. You know, if you go to the ocean, no matter where you go, right? It never stops. It never stops. So the waves going, you know, I think I'm going to crash now. What are they doing? They're just obeying what they've been programmed to do. They're not thinking about these things. But we... I'm not like that. We have to choose by, by the will that God gave us whether we're going to love or not. We have to choose that. Does that reduce his control? It does not. The reason why it does not is because that is something he has given you to do. Since he gave you the permission to do it, that means he's still in control. Even though you get to choose. Nah. So I'm trying to think of, okay, like, how do we bring that down from heaven to earth and just, like, think about, okay, so how do we illustrate this? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and so I, start, I thought of this. <clears throat> so the, the, the U.S. government, like, they print money, right? And after a while, they'll take money out of commission, and they'll, like, shred it and stuff, right? They, they do that. They print it. They take it out of circulation, um, you guys have a little pile, right? I say very little. <laughs> very little. You have a little pile. And, and within the parameters of this transcendent position of the government that decides how much money there is in circulation, you have a pile. And within that parameter, you get to spend your little pile the way you see fit, don't you? They, they're not going to tell you how to spend it, but ultimately you don't have control because they have control. Of, you know, there's no such thing as unlimited wealth. There's only so much money. You can't gather more than 100% of it. So ultimately you're not in control, if you will, but you're in control within this fenced pasture. You get to roam free. Our freedoms are limited to the parameters that God has set for us. But yet we're free to roam within the parameters of this pasture. 
So, get away from money for a second. Let's get back to, to God. So God has provided Jesus Christ as a substitutionary atonement for your sin and mine. And if you accept this gift, then you are part of God's family. You're part of the body of Christ. And if your life should end today, that relationship with Jesus would secure that you're part of God's family forever. Right? Look at somebody in the room and tell them who did that. Come on, look at someone. Who did that? God did that. God did that. Did you do that? God did that. So that's the pastor. He, he provided new life. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. But you didn't create yourself. God did. He did that. So he's created this pastor. And within that pastor, death doesn't exist for you anymore. Right? Death does not exist anymore. You're a new creation. You're part of the family forever. But... Even though God did that, he's given you some room within those parameters of new life to choose some things. You can make some choices. There's a million of them, but just let me call your attention to this. Colossians chapter 3. Go there, please. Colossians chapter 3. This is what it says right there at the beginning of the chapter. Is God in control? Is God in control? I'm not going to figure out the sovereignty of God tonight. Nobody is, but I want to have some clear understanding of this dance that, we put, that we're in with Jesus. He says, since you've been raised to new life, since you've been raised, again, God did it, right? God did that. God did that. And since he raised you to new life with Christ, amen, that's what he did. Now look. Here's some things you got to do. He set the pasture. You're part of the family. And you get to roam within the pasture in this way. In the pasture, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. See, there's some choices you have. God gives you new life. He raised you in Christ, but now that you've been raised to new life, now you have to set your eyes on the realities of heaven and set your thoughts on heaven. That's up to you to do this. How do we do it? How do we do it? How do we do it? Sounds really good. How do we do it, Paul? How do we do it, God? Well, you know what? The Sermon on the Mount is awesome because the greatest teacher ever is up on the mountain teaching us exactly how to fix our eyes and fix our thoughts on this new reality. And, and most of us are walking around and our mind is not fixed on that and our eyes are not fixed on those realities and we're thinking about the things that are here in front of us. We're not thinking about the things that are eternal. We're not thinking about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. We're thinking about our groceries, and we're thinking about our car, and we're thinking about our job, and we're thinking about our kid. And those are all good things, but we're not doing what it says by setting our thoughts and eyes on eternal things. It's not what we do. I don't do it. I'm not like saying I do it. You don't. I don't do it and not nearly enough. My daughter, 14-year-old, she said, every time I come to your house, I feel like I'm going to church. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Why is it always, she got into it with me and my wife. We had, it's been great. Like, thank you all for praying for her. But she just got into it all. Like, she made fun of me because it's always about Jesus. And she doesn't understand. Like, you're complimenting me, dude. I don't feed the monster. I'm just going to do it more, you know? And then she did even worse things. She said that I'm worse than Meredith. Meredith's like, oh, you want to see Jesus? I'm coming at you now. Like, uh, she was trying to tone it down. Like, it's, uh, she's all in now. Like, don't, don't feed the animal, all right? Just leave it alone. But we're supposed to be, like, we're, su we're supposed to be all about Jesus, we're supposed to fix our eyes. We're supposed to think about these things. That's why it's in there. It's not rhetoric. It's the reality. He wants us to choose that, but we don't do it. 
And so Jesus, up here in the Sermon on the Mount, he's actually up there on the mountain, and he's teaching us how to fix our thoughts and our sights on the realities of heaven. And if, people, if, if we want to truly flourish as a people of God, then, 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 then we got to do what he says to do. And he teaches us how to get it done. And he gets right down into the nitty-gritty, right into the dirt of our lives, right in the, into, into the everyday choices that we make about things that we do. He's not some far-off God. He's talking about how we spend our money. This isn't an old mess. This is for everybody. What we think about, what we spend our money on, this is practical stuff. And so if you want to fix your eyes on Jesus, he teaches us how to do it. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, I'm going to read a section of scripture, okay? Through uh, 34, Are you ready? Okay. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Park there for a second. You guys have heard this, this verse that says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, right, what happens? Gives you the desires of your heart. But if you're delighting in other things, they're going to give you the desires of the heart. we got to be careful what we're delighting in. What's the most important thing to you? What do you what's making your heart dance? What's making your soul dance, right? When, 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 when Jesus' mom came close to John the Baptist's mom, the baby jumped because Jesus was there, right? What makes you jump? What makes you excited, right? So you got to be careful. Wherever your, your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. See, a lot of us think that God's going to give us a new desire and then we're going to act on it. And that sounds good. I wish it was that way. It's just not. It's where your treasure is, where you determined. This is just his control, though. He, he's allowed you to make that decision. Wherever you determine your treasure, where your most precious thing is, that's where the desires are going to come from. Greater and greater and greater and greater, increasing all the time. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your light is like a lamp that provides light for your body. What do you see? We're talking about fixing your eyes on something, right? What's going in? What's going in? What are you looking at? What are you going after? The eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, looking at good things, thinking about good things, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, looking at bad things, bad pursuits, bad priorities, bad thoughts, don't be looking there, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, like if you think you're rocking the Christianity and you're totally not, that's like super dark. Because then you're fooling yourself. What, what would James say about that? Don't be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, lest you're deceiving yourself. You think you're a Christian, but if you won't do what I say, are you really? You're not my servant if you won't do as I say. A lot of lip service. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. See, we have a problem with that because we think, well, no, we can, I can love this and I can love that. And like, listen, it's not, this is not like your kids. You know, so you guys have 10 kids, and maybe after your first one, you thought, man, I couldn't love a child like I love this one. And then the next one comes. All of a sudden, you find a new place in your heart that you never knew existed. And then the third and the fourth and the fifth and this, well, maybe by seven you ran out. But I'm just saying, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Was he seven? Who's seven? Are you seven? You're nine? Who? Eric's, Eric's seven. Well, we know you love Eric. But you know what I'm saying? Like you find new areas of your heart that you didn't know existed. But like when it's, when it's with God, it's like it's a, it's a different thing for us. Like he's saying like you can't like totally love me like crazy if you're loving something else just the same. Like I got to be number one. People don't like to hear that. No one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. 
That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. This is really an amazing section here because we have been told, all of us, that there's some like certain necessities in life, right? Like we don't need a Rolls Royce, but what do we need? We need what? We need food, we need water, we need clothes, like some basic needs, right? And watch how Jesus just like slaughters those things. He's like, you think you know what you need, right? So here it is. This is, this is why I tell you not to even worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink and enough clothes to wear. Like, what? okay, Lord Jesus, like, okay, what can I worry about then? Like, you're taking everything? He's like, yeah, don't even worry about that. Never mind, forget a prosperity gospel. He's like, I'm just telling you, you don't, you don't need nothing if you have me. Watch what he says here. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't, they, aren't you more valuable to him than those birds? That's probably an answer you need to make right now. Maybe the problem isn't that you think God won't provide. Maybe the problem is that you don't think you're worthy of provision. But God's word says something about that. You are. You're worthy of that. He loves you. He wouldn't prov- like what dad provides for a child if they don't love him. They love him. That's why we do it. And that's what he's saying here. Then he says, listen, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? So he took this Thing, this mountain of importance that we have, this food, water, clothing. Like, I got to have that. And he's like, shrinks it down to nothing. It's nothing. Can it all these worries add a single moment to your life? He says, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, you guys know Solomon, this rich king way back when in Israel, he was like opulent lifestyle, had everything, right? So flowing robes, just envision him, flowing robes, big crown, you know, big throne, like big castles, gold everywhere. He says, yet Solomon, in all of his glory, some translations, splendor, was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, like something so unimportant, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father, this is awesome right here. But your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. Seek, I must say King James, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God, this translation, above all else, and his righteousness, and live righteously, And he will, this is an insane promise. And he who knows all that you need, if you do that, he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So there's like some super practical teaching here from the king of the universe through whom all things were created. But he's, he's going to teach practically. But first, we have to look at the heart of the problem. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. He's, he's, pre, he's, he's, he's preaching these rules, but then he's saying, but you missed the essence of it. He's trying to get to the heart of the law. And so again, here, here's the heart of the problem. Jesus is always going after the heart because if he wants to fix something on the outside, he goes after the inside. So here's the heart of the, pl- of the problem. If you're going to flourish, if you're going to have this abundant life, if you're going to maximize this life that God has given you, if you want to live your best life now, you have to make a choice. And that choice is this. Who or what 
is your Lord. Bottom line, you have, this is it. This is it. Like nobody, it says here that if you can't, you can't serve God and be enslaved to money. Nobody likes the word slavery, right? That's not, it doesn't have a good ring to it. But here's the thing. Sometimes you're forced into slavery by an evil taskmaster who's stronger than you, but most often, the, the Bible's so true, it says that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. You don't have to listen to everything. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to listen to God. You don't have to listen to your parents. You don't have to listen to anything. But whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. There's no power in alcohol. There's no power in sex. There's no power in drinking. There's no power in drugs. You choose to do it, it owns you. Because you gave it that throne. The Bible is true. Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. You have to determine once and for all, and I hope people are going to be set free here tonight, to make a decision once and for all that Jesus Christ is Lord. Like this is bedrock stuff. Like this is, this is the foundation. This is the core of everything that is Christianity. You, you have to make a decision, and God's been telling his people that forever. Joshua said it way, way back, fifth book of the Bible, uh, sixth book of the Bible. He goes before all of Israel, all of God's people. You think, okay, well, they get it. But he goes before the entire nation. He says, choose today who you will serve. Quit, quit beating around the bush. Get off the fence, wishy-washy, back and forth. Make a decision once and for all, who is your Lord? And Elijah, another great man of God, 1 Kings chapter 18, again, he calls forth all of God's people who are supposedly worshiping him. That's why they're called God's people, right? But even they, Elijah looks at them and he says, listen, how much longer will you waver? Hobbling between two what? How much longer are you going to go back and forth? Listen, if God is God, if the Lord is God, if he's the one who really created heaven and earth, if he's the one, then follow him. Like, make up your mind. But if Baal, that was a false god that people were worshiping, but take out the name Baal, if you will, and put in anything, if anything else is God, fine. Then follow that. Make a choice. But quit trying to follow Jesus and then follow Trump and then follow Hillary and then follow Oprah and follow your career and follow this and follow that. Every time the wind blows, you're following something else. Which one are you following? Make a choice. And I'm not surprised that the room is silent because if you read that story, guess what the next sentence is? But the people were completely silent because they don't want to make a choice. Nobody wants to stand up and make a choice. Nobody's willing to say, yes, finally, I follow Jesus Christ. All the time, in everything, in every decision, in every moment. That's what I'm following. And God's always saying to make a choice who you will serve. If I'm God, then follow me. Let me tell you something. Jesus will gladly be your Savior if you will choose today to make him your Lord. Happily. He'll rush right into that thing. If you will choose today who you will serve. Matthew 6. This is one of my favorite sections of scripture. It's not anybody else's, I think. <laughs> I don't know a lot of people that really like it. I'm glad. It's kind of hard to stomach. You want me to just not think about this stuff and just like totally let you do this? 
It's not easy. Seek first the kingdom. Listen. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Isn't my word like fire, declares the Lord? Like just burns away all the crap and gets to the point, right? Burn down the junk and let's get to the point. And isn't my, my word like a hammer that breaks up the rock? And some of us have hard hearts and we're stubborn and we know the truth and we know what God wants of us and we know how we should be living and we've read the word, we've opened it, we've read it, but we won't do it. And, and, his, and so his word is coming straight at us trying to break up this hard, rebellious rock heart of ours and even the ones like who are super spiritual and love the Lord but there's areas of your heart that are still hard and his word is there to bust that thing open so that you'll obey him. And so I think this text here in Matthew 6 is served best, straightforward, and preached directly at the problem that Jesus sees in the heart of all of us, like he did to all the people of Israel. And it's that we say that we're Christians, but we're trying to serve two and three and four and ten masters. And Jesus is not Lord in that at all. He's not one of many lords. What is he? He's the Lord of lords. He's the only Lord. There's a lot of people that pretend to be Lord, but I have news for you. They're not. And there will be a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Okay, So there's fakers and pretenders, but there's only one Emmanuel. God is with us. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus gets practical here, which is why the word becomes flesh is so cool, because he's in the mess with us, you know? He's not just this God up in heaven on some throne riding on a cloud somewhere. No, he's Jesus Christ, God in flesh, the fullness of deity, pleased to dwell in this body, in the mess with us. He knows what's up. He's not far off. And he's like, I see who your master is. He's calling the people out. He's, and he, remember last week, it's not what Jesus said. It's what Jesus says right now. You read his word, he's saying it to you right now because he's alive. And this is his word, and his word is alive. He sees who your master is. I see what dictates your thoughts. I see what dictates your motives. I see what dictates your schedule. I see what dictates your days and what they consist of and what you're chasing after. Last week, he says you're chasing after the praise of people, bottom shelf blessings. Don't chase after that. And this week, he's like you're chasing after stuff and money, and ultimately it's stuff. And that's why money becomes your master because you need more stuff. I mean, he's just saying it to us. We need more stuff. I need more stuff. I need more stuff. I need more stuff. I see your Panera $9 sandwich. I see your $7 Starbucks toasted white frappuccino mocha. I see it. I see it. I see what you do to, for my kingdom versus what you do for yourself. He's like, man, quit worrying about stupid stuff like that, food and clothes and drink. and Birds and flowers don't work hard all day to do this kind of stuff. But I'll take care of them. You don't need to waste your life pursuing these foolish things. It's a wasted life. That's not flourishing. You look at the beginning here, what we read. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth. Quit buying all this stupid stuff that rust destroys and thieves break in and moths eat it. And it's not going to last and you're making bad investments, man. What are you doing? Don't store up your treasures in heaven. Store your treasures, I mean, don't store your treasures up on earth. Store them in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Hey, I want to share something with you that was like staggering to me. Remember last, uh, I think it was last week, I told you about how much people spend on their Puppy dogs. Does anyone remember that number? What was it? $65 billion in America. 
So I was reading this about storing up treasures in heaven. I'll give you some storage unit data. I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about your garage either. You know all that crap that's in your garage that you just thought you needed so badly and you don't need anymore? You don't even know where it is? Remember those big screen TVs that you bought that you thought you needed so bad? And then five years later, you're, selling, you're giving them away on the curb? Free, please take this hunk of crap away from my house. Right? So I'm not talking about your garage. I'm not talking about the stuff that's in your shed. I'm talking about in the storage unit, right? I'm not talking about the other stuff. L listen, listen to this. So there's different size storage units, right? Don't store up your treasures on earth. Don't store up your treasures on earth. Different size storage units, and some of them are cheap, like 10, 20 bucks a month, and some of them are big time money, right? The average storage unit customer is spending $91.14 a month on storage. There's exceptions to rules, I get it, so don't go hollering at me when you have a storage unit, but most often it's stuff you're not even using, okay? $91 in 14 months for crap you're not even using. There's over 50,000 storage, self-storage units across America. That's more than Starbucks and, Ma and McDonald's combined of stuff you don't even use. Over 50,000 storage facilities equaling a total, this is what staggered my brain, equaling a total of 2.3 billion square feet of storage. What does that even mean? So, this is what you pay me for. You ready? Leesburg is 24.4 square miles. Okay, envision Leesburg. I'll know where Leesburg is, right? You're sitting in it. So like Dollar General all the way up towards to Fruitland Park where that Walmart is up there, right? And then this way too. So you imagine 20,000 people. We're living in Leesburg, right? I'm not talking about the water, just the land. 24.4 square miles. You know what that equals? That equals 15,616 acres. There's enough storage units in America to cover the entire city of Leesburg three and a half times. It's 53,000 acres. Visualize, visualize, you ready? 53,000 acres, Leesburg times three and a half, covered with your crap that didn't make the cut. Do you know how much? Okay, we spent $65 billion on Fido on your dogs and cats last year. And last year alone, 2018, Americans spent $38 billion on crap you don't even use. And when you add up, listen, I have... I have friends that are pastors in town, and we meet and we talk. And, you know, one of the things that always comes up is, you know, we have this heart to, to, to evangelize the community and the world, and we want to help the homeless and, and help the needy and spread the gospel and, and have um, awesome events out in the public so we could sing worship music outdoors and, and have people come to the Lord. You know, all this, all, we want to plant churches, send missionaries. We want to help people, right? But we're barely, church is barely getting by. And I'm not talking about just this church. I'm talking about all of them. And Americans, between Fido and, and the stuff that didn't make the cut, we spent $106 billion last year. Something's wrong. Who's your master? Who's your master when Rover gets a greater investment than Jesus Christ? What are we investing in? Who or what is our master? Chasing hard after money to buy stuff and then more money to store stuff that we don't even need. And then, of course, Jesus just 
rips that whole idea down when he talks about thieves and moths and rust. And basically, these are just summary terms for anything that would render all of our stuff as temporary. You know, you can, you can lose your stuff, you can break it, you can get it stolen, they, they fade, they become obsolete, or you just die, and then somebody else gets to use all the stuff that you thought was so valuable and you needed it, and they get to use it. But Jesus would say to your investment, switch your stock. Switch your stock, change, change your investment portfolio. Stop spending, a, listen, that, does, that, does that blow your mind at all? $106 billion on dogs and storage units. Just imagine three and a half times this city covered from wall to wall. And you know storage units don't just lay stuff on the floor, right? Way up high, cubic feet. Just all the junk that we thought we needed so bad, and we spent all that money on it, and now we're spending more to store it, and it's worthless. Three and a half times Leesburg covered in garbage, a mountain of unnecessary material. And all the while, the church of Jesus Christ, more often than not, why do you think churches are mostly 75 people or under? Because everyone there is showing up and getting involved big time and investing like crazy? Just being truthful with you. Is that too truthful? It's true. It's true. Because we're spending our resource on other things. And this isn't some offering segue at all. And it certainly isn't keep doing the same thing that you're doing all the time, but just put more money in the baskets. That's not it either. This is what is your master? Who is your master? Where's your focus? What drives you? What consumes your schedule? What owns your wallet? That's what this really is. And God makes this astounding offer to you. He says, if you'll shift your focus from building your kingdom and building up your glory and make the focus, the number one focus of your life to building his church, then he will supernaturally supply all, say all, all, all of your needs. Doesn't that just make you go, like we're working and working and working and striving so hard to make ends meet and and God, the supernatural God who spoke and the planets came out of his mouth at 186,000 miles per second, boom, he says, I, will, I know what you need and I'll take care of it. You don't need to. Does that take the pressure off? That's why he said, everyone who's tired and carry heavy burdens, come to me and I'll give you rest for your soul. You don't need to work like a crazy freak all day Stop trying to be God. I'm so better at it than you. You just do what I've asked you to do, and I'll do all the stuff you think you need to do, and it drives you crazy doing it. It's the most medicated country in the world. <laughs> How does that happen when we have the most stuff? You'd think it would be the other way around, right? The poor, starving people in tents, they should be on medication. Their life sucks. No, their life is awesome. <laughs> they're not stressed or, they're like the birds of the field and the flowers of the field they're not worried about that God just takes care of them why do you think churches in other parts of the country are exploding with growth in places they have nothing you know what they have they have trust they have trust in Jesus that he is who he says he is and listen he never lets down he, how many people in here can honestly say, I'm putting it right out there, neck out. How many people can honestly say Jesus has lied to them? And you can say it here in this church. We don't shame or shun anybody. If you say it, we'll love you through it. Anyone in here can admit that Jesus had ever lied to them? That's awesome, right? Who's batting a thousand other than him? Nobody. And so that same Jesus who's never lied, never says, if you seek first my kingdom, I'll give you everything that you need. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. The Greek word for that is, I don't know how to pronounce it, but zeteo. 
it says it's to seek, to worship, to be about. What are you doing? Well, I'm about God's kingdom. What are you doing today? That's what I'm about. That's what he says. Be about, go about, like that's what you do. What do you do for a living? I build God's kingdom. That's what I'm up, that's, that's, that's what I'm up to today. You don't have to say it to be proud, proud or boastful, because that could be arrogant. People won't like to hear that, but that should be what your life is. What do you do? Why well, go about building God's kingdom? Jesus, where are you? Well, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? That, what do you expect? Of course that's what I'm doing. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. It's not the exception. It's the rule. It's the rule. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first in you, in you, through you, in you, through you, in you, through you. Seek first the kingdom, the kingdom advancing in you, in you. First, we read God's word. We study God's word. We meditate on God's word. We serve God's people. We pray to the Lord. Lord, build me up. Fill me up. Teach me. Lead me. Guide me. I want to listen to you. That's what we sang. We're hanging on every word, Lord. We want to hear from you. That's what I want. Consume me from the inside out. I'm on my knees. I'm in the word. I'm worshiping you. I'm serving you. Build me. Build the kingdom in me, first and foremost, right? You can't build something you're not part of. So build, and then through you. So we invest. Like, literally, he's talking about money. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. <coughs> Where are you spending your money? Are you investing in others so that they can know Jesus, so that his kingdom can grow exponentially, numerically? Are you investing in that? Are you generously, earnestly giving? Generously, earnestly telling people about the word of God and what the, 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 the Savior has done in your life? Are you, are you doing that all the time? Are you, you know, it says this, that the fruit of the Spirit would, would grow and increase inside of us, but however we grow, the more we flow, remember? So, so he's building the character of Christ in me. The kingdom is growing in me, and then it should flow out of me so that that kindness that he's building inside of me would show to other people, which is very inviting to them to come to Jesus, and I serve them. <coughs> Excuse me. If this is what you give, if this is what you give yourself and your resources over to first and best and most, then God has a promise for you. He'll take care of all your needs. Bottom line. I could sugarcoat it. We could fancy it up. The bottom line is if you will make building his kingdom not a part of your life, but the most important first and best and most of your life, his promise is to provide all of your needs. And most of us would probably say, well, it's not my main thing. Like, it, it is a thing. It's definitely a thing. But it's definitely not my main thing. I would probably have to say that I spend more time working to grow my things than I do serving to grow yours, Lord. There's a section of scripture I'd like to read to you where God talks about this in detail. It's in a book of the Bible called Haggai. Many of you might not be familiar with that. But this is what I'm teaching here is very important to the Lord. And in the book of Haggai, this prophet of God, it says here that the Lord gave a message to his people through this prophet Haggai. And this is what he said. This is the word of the Lord, man. He says in verse 3 of chapter 1, then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. This is what he said. This is the Lord speaking, okay? Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? Bless you. I want to stop there for a second and just say, we're not here to build this building pretty. Can it be pretty? Awesome, great. You want to come and paint it? Paint away. You want to buy new seats for the place? Go for it. What's the house? What's the house? In, in the New Testament times, what's the house? The body of Christ, right? We are the, we are the house of the Lord, right? And individually, we're like little houses. We're like condos in a subdivision, 
Because you're, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you and 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 all of us. But together, we're God's house. We're his people, right? So why is it that you're, I mean, just doesn't take a brain surgeon here. Why are you, why are you working on your stuff, making everything nice for you, while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what happened. Look at what's happening to you. So you, you've planted much but harvest little. You eat but you're not satisfied. You drink but but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. Do you ever feel like that? That like it doesn't make any difference how hard you work, how much you try to save. It doesn't matter how much nice stuff you buy. It's never enough. You don't have enough money to pay your bills. I couldn't possibly tithe or, or give something to the work of the Lord. I can't even pay my bills. And what's God saying here? The reason why you can't is because you're investing it wrong. It doesn't matter how much you have because no matter what you have, it feels like you're putting your paycheck into your pocket with holes in it. And you're losing it. I, I just feel like we have to keep reading here, okay? Because I know there's something. Keep reading. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. This is what we do. We, we don't invest in, in, our, in our time and in our treasure and, and all that to, to, to advancing the kingdom of God. We spend more time and more of our resource on ourself. And he says, now, this is what's happening. Now go up. Like, he's like, stop that. Stop that. Go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. See, you hope for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies. While all of you are busy building your own fine houses, it's because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crop. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees and all of your crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I see a God who's opposing you if you will not change your focus and stop building your kingdom and start building his, he's going to work against you in order to get you into this room tonight to hear this so that you will make the choice to change who your master is. That's what I believe. And I believe that someone, if not more, will be changed tonight because sovereign God, the sovereign God that I don't understand, he is working on you and he is pressured you pressure 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 and no matter what you've done to get ahead you can't and he's here tonight to say you will never get ahead switch your stock choose your master and jesus is a hammer of truth if you're a person whose life is run by working to make money to pay for stuff he says in Matthew 6, 31, where's your faith? He's like, why are you trying to be God, man, when I am, I am not only able, but I'm willing to take care of all your needs, and you're trying so hard to do it. Verse 32, he says, this is awful. These things, like worrying about money and food and clothing and working to get this and working to get that, he says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Like, just cuts you right at the knees, right? And you're like, well, I love you, Jesus. Yeah, well, you know what? Pagans, heathens, people don't even believe in me. That's what they worry about. Christians aren't supposed to worry about that. I got that. I got that. So who's your master? Who's your Lord? That's really the question here. It's the down and the dirt daily decisions that we see here in Matthew chapter 6 that decide this. King Solomon, this wealthy guy that I talked about earlier, he 
said that pursuing education and wealth and women and drink and power and stuff was like chasing the wind. C.S. Lewis last week I quoted, he said, that's like making mud pies in a slum. And I told you it was bottom shelf blessings. True human flourishing is not the gathering of a bunch of stuff, but true human flourishing is finding purpose and fulfillment and joy in the building of the king's kingdom. That's true flourishing. And it only occurs when you seek his kingdom first and best and most. And so what he's saying here really, guys, is that we need to stop playing God and let God be God. We all are so jealous of the people in the scriptures where God showed up and did amazing things. And he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And he wants to do these awesome things. Like, you don't need to get to the church and go, oh, God, please do stuff. Like, he wants to do stuff. It's just that you get in the way of him doing stuff because you won't let him do stuff. He wants to supernaturally provide all of your needs, but you won't let him because you're providing your needs. But you're stressed and strained and tired and miserable, and you have to Prozac yourself to supply all your needs. When he's like, just rest, brother, and I'll provide it. Stop being God and let me be God. Make a better choice. Get a better blessing. Be all about, you've heard this before, be all about his business and his promises that he'll be all about yours. And I'm not talking about cash. Really, it's not that. It's about motiv the motivation of your days. It's how you live your life. It's the focus of your mind. It's the use of your resources. What's your master? Who is your master, really, is the question. Would you come, please? I want to do something a little different tonight. I've been doing a lot of things different lately, and I think that they're all beautiful in their own way. I realized last week when I realized that there was nothing, and while there was nothing, he was something in that nothing, and the something spoke into the nothing, and there was something. Boom, right? I don't understand God. So there's variety, diversity, and beauty in all this. So we change things up a little bit. I want to do something a little different with you tonight. I want, to, I want to allow God the space to actually take his word and the message that you got and to actually do something in you. Like, if we are hearers of the word but not doers, it's worthless. You're only deceiving yourself, okay? So instead of just praying about what to give, because, like, this message is unashamedly got money all up in it, right? So like, I know no one likes when churches talk about money, but if Jesus talked about it, then I feel completely free to talk about it. It's what it says. And so I want to I want to give God the opportunity to break you free from some shackles that might have you. And it's not just money, it's about the motivation of your heart, it's about who your master is, who your lord is. And a lot of people, like I said, they come to church and the offering plate goes around and they start to sweat it out because like they barely have enough to, to pay their bills. It's like, how could I give more? And so what Jesus would say to that here tonight is if you would seek first the kingdom, like literally he's talking about money here, like invest in that and you don't have to worry about your needs. So I know where, you know, there's only, you know, he's God. And we don't need to like supernaturally like come after him and challenge him and stuff. But I think he's kind of doing that for us. Like if you'll do it, watch what I'll do. Like just watch what I'll do. Like you can't expect him to act supernaturally if you don't do what it says. So you've heard the word of God proclaimed to you hopefully with some clarity. If he's working on you, that's awesome. We're going to sing a song right now. It's called King of My Heart. And that's really what this is all about, right? So it's to, to determine who the king of your heart really is. And so I want you to sing this song. And while, it's, while you're singing it, as he's ministering to you, just whatever he tells you to do about giving, 
just come up and give it. Or if you want, you can leave your offering on your seat. You can put it in the walls back, the, the boxes on the wall. But let this be your time of prayer and worship. And so not just to sing a song, but to live as he 